you are young or old, whether you are a first time uh, visitor here or you have been worshiping with us for years, whether you come full of doubts or full of confidence, joy or sorrow, we are in this place family because of what Jesus Christ did for us. Let us stand and uh, say our call to worship as we are here. God calls the people to justice. God promises to be with us until justice is achieved. We trust in God to be with our Christ. The old ways are fleeing. God's new ways of justice is coming. We know that nothing can separate us from the love of God through Jesus Christ. So let us in confidence confess the wrong that we have done. Holy God, we have taken the name of Jesus as our Savior, and yet we have not committed ourselves to the agenda of peace and justice. We are content to defend our rights and possessions, but care little about the nameless people who suffer daily from oppression and want. Forgive us and empower us with your Spirit, that we may truly walk the path of Jesus, and set people free to live in justice and peace throughout the world. Amen. Through the love and mercy of God, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. scripture passage comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm 29, and we're going to read this responsively, so I'll start with the first verse, and you uh, come in with the second one, and we'll alternate back and forth. Listen to the word of God. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength.
brings us to our prayer time together this morning. I would uh, ask you to keep Dallas Giddens in your prayers, to continue to keep him in your prayers. Uh, he is home and he is recovering and he's doing well, so we want to keep him in our prayers. Also, we have a praise. Alice Wilbur on the 2nd of January became a great grandmother. <laughs> Katarina Jean Dudermeyer was born the 2nd and uh, to Ashley and Cameron Dudermeyer. Uh, so congratulations, Alice. Let us join together in prayer. <clears throat> praise the Lord. Our soul praises you, O Lord. We will sing praises to you as long as we live. We will not put our trust in our government or to influential people, for when they die, their influence and power are gone. We are blessed because we hope and trust in you, O God. You created the world and everything in it. You were a faithful God to our spiritual fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you remain unchanging and faithful to us in this century and on to the end of time. You uphold those of us who are weighed down with the cares of this world. And you feed those who are hungry with the bread of life. You set prisoners free with the assurance that their sins are forgiven and that you are in control of the events of their lives. You give sight of understanding to those who are blind in their sin. You lift up those who are bowed down, and you love those who are righteous. You watch over us, aliens in a sinful world, and you are a father to the orphan and a comforter to the widow. You do not allow the plans of the wicked to flourish or to come to completion. You will reign forever and for all generations. And we know that you sit upon your throne, sovereign and mighty. No matter what is going on in our world, the chaos, the confusion, the doubt of our institutions of government, Lord, we know that you are in control of this world and that your will will be done. So keep our hearts and thoughts in Jesus Christ, your Son, our only Savior, who has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our brothers. Sunday after the Epiphany, when we celebrate the three wise guys. <laughs> we don't know if they were kings or not. Uh, the, the word in the Greek is masculine plural, so wise men, I suppose, although some would say that's an oxymoron. <laughs> but we celebrate not only that day, but according to our liturgy, we celebrate the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry in the desert of Judea. So today I'm going to read to you from the Gospel according to Mark, the first verse beginning at the first chapter. This is the Word of God. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, practicing a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were 
baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me, please. Our Father and our God, we need your guidance for the future. You alone know what the future holds for us. Only you can give us the strength and wisdom we will need to meet its challenges. Let us keep our eyes on you. We pray for our nation and its leaders during these difficult times, and for all those who are seeking to bring peace and justice to our dangerous and troubled world. Bring our divided nation together. Your word reminds us that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Bless all who guard and serve us, Lord, especially those among the medical profession right now. Help us to make a commitment to make you the foundation and center of our lives this year. This we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, who by his death and resurrection has given us hope, both for this world and the world to come. Amen. Our nation has perhaps never been more in need of that prayer than we are today. That is the prayer we have been praying here since the beginning of 2020, of course, written by Billy Graham in 2008 in what he then called Troubled Times. It was in what we would now call the rather tame election contest between Barack Obama and John McCain. But just as a prophet like John, Graham's words have stood the test of time. And we need them now more than ever, do we not? Billy Graham was, of course, first and foremost, a, a great preacher. I wonder if he got a lot of coffee mugs. <laughs> One of the occupational hazards of being a, a pastor is that on my birthday and at Christmas time, I receive a lot of, of coffee mugs. Let's, let's read them together like Family Feud, okay? Careful, or you'll end up in my sermon. Well, some of you have experienced that more than once. Okay, together. Don't make me use my pastor voice. And my favorite lately is this. Pastor, because hardcore devil stomping ninja isn't an official job title. Very kind for those of you who have encouraged me with that. <laughs> so I wonder what sort of mugs Billy Graham got. Those of you who know me know that Graham is my one of my favorite preachers. Maybe wonder, who would Jesus say was his favorite preacher? Of course, Anybody who preaches his word is probably the right answer, just like if a teacher was asked, will always say that they love all of their students just the same, which is, of course, a great big fat lie. 
Of course, all teachers have favorite students, students who lead in the classroom, who are the first to raise their hand, who behave well. So I guess, I suppose we could guess, uh, would it be Billy Graham, I wonder? Or perhaps another, one of my favorite preachers would be Jesus' favorite preacher, T.D. Jakes, a powerful speaker. Or somebody who has reached people globally, like Lyle Schuler. Or maybe the most popular preacher in the United States today, Joel Osteen. But why does it have to be an American, I wonder? Perhaps Jesus' favorite preacher is Dr. Kim Sam Wan, pastor of the largest Presbyterian church in the world in Seoul, South Korea, with over 100,000 members meeting in seven different worship services spread over each weekend. Now those are pretty impressive numbers. But I'm betting that if Jesus were to really answer this question, the question of who was his favorite preacher, it would probably be his cousin, that snappy dresser, John the Baptist. <laughs> Fred Craddock, the professor of preaching, who could arguably be the runner-up to John as Jesus' favorite preacher, says there's no question about that. He says there was no human being more influential in the life of and career of Jesus than Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. We knew that when the day came for Jesus to begin his ministry, he took off his carpenter's belt and handed it to his, probably his little brother James to take over and set out to find the place in the wilderness where John was preaching. Why now? I wonder. Why that particular time when he was about 30 years of age? Well, Craddock speculates that it was because the Romans had just rounded up a lot of people and crucified them on the side of the road. No trials, no juries, just troublemakers, they thought, and the crosses were lined up like telephone poles. Craddock said that it would not go unnoticed by Jesus, and maybe he thinks, I can't stay just a carpenter anymore. It might have been when the word came into town that John was in the wilderness. Have you heard about John? Have you ever heard him preach? It must have been very impressive. John was preaching about a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John, who was brutally honest with the Pharisees and the scribes and calls them vipers. John, who didn't like to follow the rules. He was a rebel. He did not like authority. And he was not afraid to talk tough. John, who was sort of the... Harry Callahan of the desert, warning, warning about the coming baptism of fire. Go ahead, make my day, he tells them. <laughs> Even Herod the king had heard John preach. John was very critical of, of Herod, especially for his having married his brother's wife. Maybe it was John. Maybe that's why Jesus left. He went through the dark gap of the valley of Jezreel into the heated Jordan Valley of the desert country in the south of Palestine, where this extraordinary man, John, was preaching. To get to John, Jesus had to go through the desert. The two were already close, Luke tells us. They were cousins, only six months apart in age. The mothers were related, Elizabeth the Old and Mary the Young. The Madonna del Cardellino was painted by Italian master Raphael in 1505 <laughs> for the wedding of a friend, a wealthy merchant from Florence. No, not that Florence. <laughs> I should have said Florence, Italy. That's where, that's where it came from. The man, the painting portrays Jesus Christ's mother, Mary, with two children who are playing with a bird. The children symbolized John the Baptist and the young Jesus Christ, and the goldfinch 
The bird that feeds among thorns is interpreted as the representing Christ's future suffering. I can't show you the thorns uh, on the ground because as it turns out, like in a lot of classical paintings, the infant Jesus is not actually wearing pants. <laughs> but over the centuries, the artwork, like most artwork, the colors faded and dirt accumulated on the painting. Nobody knows how exactly, perhaps during an earthquake, the painting, which was on wood, was shattered into 19 different shards. The contemporary restoration project fixed the shattered areas, removed layers of paint and dirt to get the colors back. It was a team effort. It took 50 people 10 years to restore the painting. But the result is stunning. The cracks are gone. Centuries of brown film and grime are gone. The dulling veneers and patches have been stripped away, and the finished project literally glows with all of the deep colors, the reds and the blues, the golds of the original work of art. Given how badly it was damaged, its restoration of Raphael's painting is arguably even more amazing than the painting itself. So the original was splendid, but the miracle of restoration compounds that beauty. Knowing the drama of the whole story, you can only stare at it in wonder. So the spiritual parallels, of course, are profound. They speak to a far greater masterpiece of restoration. The one that the Lord wants to do in your life and in your mind. Tragically, the beautiful design that God has created in each of us has been marred by sin. By the layers of grime and dirt that have collected on our souls, maybe you have even felt them or sensed them in your life. You thought you could paint over the damage, paint over the sin, but it didn't work. And the patches, the veneers that you applied just made things worse, and the cracks are now showing. Maybe you have experienced earthquakes that have shattered you. But the good news of the gospel, the gospel that John presented, is that Jesus will have the power to make all things new. Just Having a relationship with Jesus makes John special. You can have one too. We don't have all the information, Craddock says, but when Jesus came to John, he heard John. He was with John. He was probably, no doubt, influenced by John. Craddock points out that the whole New Testament announces that John is one of the most extraordinary figures in the history of Jesus Christ. The Apostle John, in his gospel, starts with that marvelous poem, the hymn to Christ, in the beginning was the Word. And twice he interrupts that by saying there was one who came, his name was John, to, to prepare the way, but he was not the light. Why does he interrupt his song to Jesus twice? Says, and he says, I'm not singing about John. Because John was so great, some would think, oh, the Messiah has to be John. John himself was very clear about that. He many times stated, I am not the Messiah. He realizes his limitations. But he fulfills a role each of us should when, even though he is not the message, he is, maybe, perhaps, its greatest messenger. Like Herod Antipas said after he had John killed, when he heard about Jesus, he said, Oh my God, that is John again, come back from the dead. Just to point out how great John was, Luke also states in the book of Acts that 
There was a very eloquent teacher from North Africa who went to Corinth, Greece, where he wanted to preach in the church, and his first sermon was about John, the Christ of God. Well, it didn't take long for Paul to do some corrective teaching there, and the preacher actually went on to become very successful, a proponent for Jesus Christ. Craddock said that by the year 50 AD, there were groups still following John on three different continents. John baptized Jesus. Jesus preached his first sermon based on John's teachings. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. The synoptic gospels say that Jesus didn't really even begin his preaching in earnest until John had been locked up in prison. When John was killed, Jesus said there was nobody greater ever born of a woman than John the Baptist. Why? John never does any miracles. In fact, the very fact that God speaks at the baptism is all about Jesus, not John. His mission was to be a witness to the light. Oh, I pray that that is your mission as well as mine. When we perform the function of messenger like that, we are doing more good than we know. The things that we do today, sowing seeds of sharing the truths about who Jesus is, people might one day refer to as the first things that prompted them to think of Jesus. George Matheson, famous blind Scottish preacher and hymn writer, said that for his part he would be satisfied not to have some great tombstone over his grave, but just to know that people were gathering there to say that you know, he never performed any miracles. He was a good man, but he told me about Christ, which led me to come to him later. Did you ever hear John preach? A lot of people did. The Gospels say that people came all over the place, from Lebanon and Assyria, Jordan, Israel, Arabia. No masks. John must have been pre-COVID. <laughs> in the desert, standing in the, the blazing heat, the, the sun, sand swirling in their faces, people were together who had sworn on their mother's graves to never get caught dead with those people. <coughs> Jews and Arabs standing there together. When, when you hear the word of God preached, you tend to forget why you hate the person next to you. I'm sure a lot of them came out of pure, sheer curiosity. Craddock says that he could imagine the teenagers sitting around on the hoods of their camels. <laughs> Nothing else to do, saying, have, have you heard John preach? No. Well, let's go out there. Couldn't really blame them. He was an oddity. He had a tremendous beard, better than ZZ Top. He never trimmed his beard. He never cut his hair. Never. He didn't have a little ponytail like the hipsters from Tucson. He had a long, glorious ponytail. Not because he was countercultural. He was a Nazarite. They weren't supposed to cut their hair. He was strange. He dressed in an unusual way. And his food, well, he'll never want home with somebody else for lunch. His diet were uh, locusts and honey, which I suppose some consider a delicacy. But John would say, do you want to come home and have lunch with me? And he'd say, no thanks, John. Brain check. All the Gospels say crowds came to him. They left their sprinklers going in the backyard. They left, the, the, they left their, their bread in the oven. They left uh, school if it had been meeting. Uh, so both teachers and students could go hear John preach. The crowds came to hear him. 
Now, if you're like me, right now you could really use a break from a lot of the political talk that's going on. See, John was no politician. He was not trying to make yes sound like no and no sound like yes. He said, the judge is coming. And later, like the later prophet Harry Callahan, he said, you have to ask yourself this, do you feel lucky? John was not like candles in the sanctuary. He was like a wildfire. He was, didn't have a pulpit of wood. It was a stump or a rock or a cactus. And the River Jordan was his baptistry. When the sermons were over, people would come up to him to talk to him. Well, John, what are we supposed to do? John said, if you have food, share it. If you have clothes, share that. Tax collectors came up to John and asked him what they should do. He said, don't take any more money than your due. Be fair. Standing around the outskirts of the crowd, nervously trying to keep the peace, the soldiers would wait until everybody else was gone, and then they'd shuffle up awkwardly and say, what are we supposed to do? And he would say, no unnecessary violence. Don't intimidate people. And no foraging around to supplement your income. Be content with your wages. Did you ever hear John preach? It must have been absolutely terrifying. Acts to the root of the tree, burning up the chaff, a winnowing fork in his hand. Repent! But that wasn't the most awe-inspiring or even terrifying thing. He spoke with the voice of God. People knew they were in God's presence when they heard him speak. That's what everybody wants. No, but that's what everybody doesn't. Didn't Paul say that? I, I do not what I want to do, and, I, and uh, I don't do what I want to do. But when you're in the presence of God, hearing his voice, you know it is the moment of truth. Repent, the Messiah is coming. That is why everybody hopes that God grades on a curve. John preached that Jesus, that God, treats everybody the same way. Some churches think you can only reach people when they are down and out. But people pretty much have problems all the time. doesn't matter if you're standing on the central podium, crying your eyes out with that medal hung around your neck and they're playing your national anthem, or if you're being wheeled into a sanctuary because you have muscular dystrophy. Everybody has the same fundamental problem. It doesn't matter if you're at the height of your earning power or if you're sticking your head into the post office asking, have the stimulus checks come yet? It doesn't matter if you're at the university bowing your head to receive the doctoral gown or if you're 59 years old at the literacy center trying to learn how to read and write. It's all the same. Craddock says, these are the moments when you realize your need for God is all the same. We tend to think we have too much stuff, don't we, sometimes? Especially if you're going to move. That's when you realize you have way too much stuff. Craddock remembers his friend who was a missionary in China. But when they cracked down on religion, he was sentenced to house arrest for many years. One day, the soldiers came and said, you can return to America now. While they were celebrating, the soldiers told them, you can take 200 pounds with you. That's when the arguments broke out. His kids had stuff, he had stuff, his wife had stuff. They'd all been there for years. I've got to take my typewriter, it's practically brand new. We have to take this base, it's ancient. But we 
have to take our toys and our books They weighed what they could weigh. They weighed this, they weighed that, they took this off the scale, they put that on, until the whole pile got exactly to 200 pounds, not an ounce more or a gram less. And when they put the whole thing together, the soldiers came back, are you ready to go? Yes. You weighed everything? Yes. You weighed the children? Oh. <laughs> said, no, we hadn't weighed the children. Weighed the children. That is the moment when you realize what's important, what you have, and what is trash. The typewriter, trash. The ancient base, trash. If you've ever heard John preach, you know that he preached about what was important. He tells you when something is important. The need for repentance. The need for a savior. You see, most of the time, the clergy in Israel were telling the Pharisees and the Sadducees how great they were. But John the Baptist spoke the message of truth. There is judgment coming. Have you heard John preach? If you haven't, you will. Because the only way to get to Nazareth is through the desert. Well, that's not, that's not really true, I guess. You can get to Nazareth without going through the desert, but you just will not find Christ there. Pray with me, please. Thank you, Father, for sending your servant John and the many people he reached. But do not let us forget, he was only the messenger. Give us the message. Give us Jesus, Lord. Give us Jesus. They can have all of the rest. Just give us Jesus. Amen. Well, there are two opportunities this week that you can come and get some exercise walking, not in the desert, but inside in our Family Life Center on Mondays and Thursdays. The Women's Bible Study is back up, running on Zoom and Wednesdays at 10 o'clock. And Thursday mornings, our men's fellowship is studying a new book. Uh, well, it's not a new book, but it's uh, by Robbie Zacharias. It's a new study for us. It's called Jesus and Secular Gods, Among Secular Gods. Uh, so all of those opportunities are for you. And we are going to move into taking our offering uh, now. Uh, for you, those of you who are present in the building, you can drop your offering in the basket on your way out. Or if you're at home, you can send it to our, uh, our office here at Cotton, uh, 702 East Cottonwood Lane, uh, Casa Grande, Arizona, 85122. Or visit our website. There's an opportunity to give there also. Uh, so let's now pray together as we take our offering today. Please pray with us. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. Amen. Would you please stand if you are able for the benediction? Yes, we ask God to bring our divided nation together. We remember the words of John, repent. And the Savior is coming. So we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, who by his death and resurrection, he has given us hope, both for this world and the world to come, we ask for his blessing, that we might be his followers. And we do so under the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. 
One God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.